Okay, this is Derek Thompson, and I am going to kind of just finish the lecture in 1.6 through this video. And so the idea is that on Tuesday, we'll be able to come back and just do some exercises in class and really get some practice. So first off, this first example, this is example 6 in section 1.6. Um, if you are in my 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. class, we already did this, so you can kind of skip it. So this is more for the 11 a.m. of first year. And so what I want to do is I want to compute the limit as x goes to infinity of <coughs> x squared plus 1 minus x. And this has the same problem as if you get 0 over 0. If you plug this in, in the, in the sense that you can plug in infinity and you get infinity minus infinity, that doesn't really tell you anything. So what we need to do is we want to create fractions because that is how we've been able to work with infinity so far. So I'm going to do that by multiplying by the conjugate. So this is x squared plus 1 plus x. Uh, square root of x squared plus 1 and then plus x. And when I do that, the advantage of multiplying by the conjugate is that the numerator just becomes a difference of squares here, so x squared plus 1 because of the square root squared, and then you subtract x squared, and now you've got this denominator. Now at this point, the x squareds will cancel, and you'll just have 1 over the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. Now here, unfortunately, uh, I can't really give you a formula. This is just something that you kind of think about here. And what you can think about is, as x gets very large, that if you look at the denominator, first that x on the right is getting very large because that's the identity. x squared plus 1 is also becoming very large. And if I square root something, it square root still kind of goes off to infinity, just slower. So the square root of something very large is still very large. And they're both positive. So when I add those two very large positive numbers, that denominator essentially is very large. And so that means that the denominator is tending towards infinity, so overall the limit is tending towards zero. So that's not exactly uh, a very formal argument, but that is how you'd approach this problem. Okay, so the next example is for everybody. And this is the limit as x goes to infinity of the sine of 1 over x. And the way this works is that we're going to make a substitution. So we're going to let t equal 1 over x. And now when I make the substitution, I can say this is the sine of t, but I have to change the limit as well. But I see that t goes to 0 as x goes to infinity, because t is basically the function 1 over x. So I can change this to t going to 0. So if that doesn't quite make sense, we'll do a lot more examples on Tuesday. But the idea is that when you substitute a variable, you should also um, adjust the limit to, comp to match the new variable and what the new variable is doing. So if the old variable is going to infinity, the new variable is going to zero in this case. And so this limit is one that we know. This is one that you can just use the direct substitution property and get zero. <laughs> so now we want to think about what if you have infinity in both a and L. So I mean what if you have the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is infinity. All that means is that f becomes large as x becomes large. So uh, this is what a lot of polynomials do with their end behavior. So a lot of this is just how the function shoots off to either infinity. And of course, I can replace either infinity with plus or minus infinity. So let's look at x cubed. x cubed looks like this. And I can say that the limit as x goes to infinity of x cubed is positive infinity because the function is shooting off and the y values to infinity. And if I took x to go to negative infinity, well, you can see that the y values are going to negative infinity in that case. And again, you can kind of use uh, properties about factors. And so the way we can do that would be 
something like example 10 here. So if I want the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus x, first of all, like I said before, you can't write infinity minus infinity. That would say it's 0, and that's not true. What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor... And now, just like before in the class we were talking about division factors, for multiplication factors, it's the same idea. The x factor is going off to infinity as x goes to infinity, because that's the identity. But x minus 1, that's also going to infinity. So if you looked at those two functions, if you looked at x, that's the identity, and x minus 1 is the identity shifted down, both of those, as x goes to the far right, the y values go up to infinity. And they both go to positive infinity. So they're both getting very large and positive. And so when I multiply those, that's very large and positive. So that would be infinity. And so to end this chapter, we have some definitions of uh, the epsilon delta versions. And we kind of show what's just a little bit different. So <clears throat> for the limit as x approaches a, to say that that's infinity, like if we have an asymptote, that means for every positive number m, so instead of epsilon we're going to use this big M, so every positive m, there is a delta, just like before, so that if 0 is less than x minus a is less than delta, so your x values are within delta of a, then f is bigger than that. And so <coughs> that's the idea with the infinite limit. We change the f of x minus l. We change that. Normally that's within epsilon of absolute value. It's less than or equal to epsilon. We change that to just saying f is bigger than m. So it's a little bit of a simpler definition. So let me show you uh, an example. We'll use that definition to prove that the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x squared is infinity. That's the example we kept using in class. So we want to know about when 0 is less than x is less than delta. Normally it's x minus a, but the a is 0, right? So we want to figure out something about absolute value of x less than something, right? And that's when 1 over x squared is greater than m. So this is the replacement of normally we write f of x minus l less than epsilon. Now we just write the functions bigger than m. And we manipulate this to create a situation where we try to look at absolute value x. And the first thing I can do is I can take the reciprocal of both sides, but that flips the inequality. And you can only do that when they're both positive or both negative which in this case they're both positive. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the square root of both sides since they're both positive or zero. Now, but remember uh, the square root of x squared because you definitely get something positive there, that's just the absolute value of x. That's a trick about square roots and squares. And that's less than the square root of 1 over n. And so that's what we take delta to be. 1 over n, square root. So uh, that is what we use, and the actual proof would be that if 0 is less than x is less than delta, which is the square root of 1 over m, then 1 over x squared, well, because that's in the denominator, that's greater than 1 over delta squared. And that is equal to m. So there's a lot of subtleties there to think about. Okay, so now let's go on to one more definition here. And this is the epsilon delta if we do a horizontal asymptote. And so this means, now we're back to epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero there is a positive n so that if x is bigger than the n rather than f of x 
then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So the f of x minus l is less than epsilon. That's how it, we normally see it. But then x is greater than a. So to give you an example of that, what if we wanted to use that definition to show the horizontal asymptote of 1 over x was 0? Then we want to find out about x being greater than n based off f of x minus l being less than epsilon. So that's 1 over absolute value x. But the trick here is that we can assume here that x is positive because we're taking x larger than n, which is larger than 0. So if x is positive, we don't need the absolute value. And now we can use the same reciprocal trick to say that x is less than 1 over epsilon. Excuse me, we have to flip the sign when we do that. So x should be greater than 1 over epsilon. So if x is greater than 1 over epsilon, that's what we can use for n. n is kind of like the new delta here. So to actually do the proof, we would say that if n x is greater than this n, which is 1 over epsilon, then we can say that 1 over x minus 0, that's 1 over x, that's going to be less than epsilon, because of the fact that if x is greater than 1 over epsilon, we use the same trick where if you flip both sides, you flip the inequality from greater than to less than. And that completes that proof. And if you want to think of those together, you get rid of the absolute values altogether. So if you want to think about the strict definition of an infinite limit being infinity, this means that for every m positive, there is an n positive so that if x is bigger than the n then the function value is bigger than the m and that's what we saw with x cubed so if you look at x cubed no matter what uh, y value you give me if you give me some y value here you say this high well then if I kept going I could find some uh, x value where from that x value onward, that's a little too thick, from that x value onward, all of the y values are bigger than the, for the horizontal line you drew. So it's a bit of a simpler concept than our usual uh, epsilon delta definition. So I've got a bit more time here, so let me just do some examples from uh, 1.6 to finish this out. I'll give you some idea what's going on. So let's uh, do 24 here since I caught my eye. This is the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared over the square root of x to the fourth plus 1. So I'm going to kind of combine some tricks that we've had. One trick before we didn't have roots was to factor the biggest uh, power out of the top and bottom, and we see an x squared on top, and so I'm going to kind of try to do that in the root. So I'm going to factor an x to the fourth out, and now I can separate roots over products. So I can say this is the square root of x to the fourth and the square root of 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth. And the point is that if we're taking x to be very large, so close to infinity, we're taking it to be positive. And so that means that I don't have to worry about plus or minuses or absolute values or anything. So that in that case, the square root of x to the fourth is just x squared. And that means I can cancel those terms right there. So that means my next step is to write just the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over 
the square root of 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth. But remember, uh, we're able to move limits into compositions, and that means I can just look at the limit under the roots. And when I do that, I see that essentially the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 is just 1, and then 1 over x to the fourth goes to 0. So at that point, I see that it's 1 over the square root of 1, which is just 1. Okay, so that was 24. Let's see. Let's go ahead and also do uh, 28 here. So this is x goes to infinity of sine squared x over x squared. So <clears throat> the trick here is this is another one that you kind of have to think about. Sine x over x, we had that limit for um, uh, this is at, when x was 0. However, way back a long time ago for other limits, we talked about how when I first introduced the squeeze theorem, we talked about how if you have two functions that are always less than or equal to each other, uh, you can take the limits on both sides and keep the inequality. So if you think about sine squared x, that is always less than or equal to 1 because sine, both factors of sine, that's sine times sine, but both factors bounce back and forth between uh, 1 and minus 1. And so that means that I could go ahead and say sine squared, over, sine squared x over x squared is less than or equal to 1 over x squared. And that means that I can say that the limit of the left hand is less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of the right hand. And that second limit is 0. And so the theorem that I'm using here is part of the squeeze theorem. Let me find that theorem. That theorem is theorem 3 and 1.4. And so that still applies to these infinite limits. All right, let me do one more example here. And uh, how about 15 here? So this is 15 and 1.6. This is limit as x goes to 1 of 2 minus x over x minus 1 squared. So this one is a uh, asymptote is what we're concerned about. But we want it so this is an asymptote but we want to check if it's going to uh, positive or negative infinity. So what we need to do is we need to check uh, on both sides. So the reason why this is an asymptote is because if you just plug in 1, you get 1 over 0, right? So anything non-zero divided by 0 means that you probably have an asymptote. And so I want to check the limit on the right and the left and see if they agree. And if they agree and they have the same infinity, then we have an overall limit. So let's look as I approach from the right. So if I'm approaching from the right, I'm taking values just bigger than 1. So I'm taking things like 2, 1.5, 1.1, 1.01, and so on. And in that case, 2 minus x, well, I'm taking, as I get closer and closer, I'm taking things that are less than 2, right? So those are positive. So I'm taking things uh, like 1.5, 1.1, 1.01, and that's going to be a positive x minus 1 squared, because I square, it doesn't really matter. This is always positive. Unless I take 1, but I'm not taking 1. I'm taking close to 1. So that means that this limit uh, is going to be infinity because I'm taking a positive divided by a positive, right? So over the overall expression is positive. And so if I have positive large numbers, this is going to be infinity. Now if I go from the left... I'm thinking of numbers really close to 1, like 
0 0.9, 0 0.99, those kind of things. And so those are going to be things that are still going to keep 2 minus x positive if I subtract numbers between 0 and 1. And x minus 1 squared, that's still positive because I'm squaring, right? So if I divide two positive numbers, I get positive numbers. And that means that this limit, I could just go ahead and say, is equal to positive infinity. Because I know it's an asymptote, and because I know that the factors are a positive divided by a positive, so I know that the numbers are going to positive infinity and not negative infinity. And because the limits on the left and the right are the same, that's what I mean when I say that they agree, the overall limit is positive infinity. Okay, let's stop there, and then Tuesday we will just have plenty of time to practice.